Good morning. Here we go. It's wonderful to worship with you again. I uh, think we met over 12 years ago, and it's just been wonderful to be sent out from such a wonderful church. And thank you, Cornerstone. You've given, you've prayed, and uh, in a way, we've done this together. And so I'm back. I'm on a six-month furlough, so I do 12 years on the field and six months back. That's just how it worked out. But, um, but my girls, they're actually in school in America for the first time in their lives. Um, and that's been a good experience for them. And our, so I want to show a picture of my daughters. Yeah. Yep, there's uh, my oldest is in the front, Sadie. So she just started university. We dropped her off at her dorm at the end of August. And I haven't dealt with those emotions. So hopefully I won't like blow up. But yeah, and then Bella's behind her. She's a junior. She's on the soccer team. And then Penelope's got the flower in her hair. She's also on a soccer team. And Clementine, my little redhead, she's on the volleyball team. And uh, God gave me four daughters. So that means my favorite scent is toasted coconut, and I love pink, <laughs> right? <laughs> and if I need the bathroom, I've got to go to the gas station. <laughs> um, I want to share what God's been doing in the kingdom of God. And uh, we have some amazing testimonies, and I want to report back on that. And I'll share a little bit of scripture do a little bit of preaching, but mostly I just want to share what God has been doing in the kingdom of God and these wonderful testimonies. So we'll start just by reading out of Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses uh, 18 through 20. So this is the Lord, and he's just resurrected, and he's with his disciples, and he says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And I just want to lean in a little bit on that verse when it says Christ is there, and he says all authority has been given to me. And he has completed a task that he was fully man. He, he understood the pain. He understood the, the hardships. He felt it all. And, and, and even in those moments when he went to the Father and a command was given to him, he chose to be obedient even unto death. And he became the atonement. He died on the cross and was risen from the grave. And all authority was given to him. So I, I, I know that there is difficulties that have come together as we've gathered here I know there's stress, I know there's illnesses, there's unsaved family members, there's pain, and all of that we can just, we can bundle it together and we can lay it at the feet of Jesus and knowing that he is worthy with all authority. So Father, we thank you for this morning and the things that make us upset, the things that make us struggle, the things that we're in pain with, Lord. We just lay at your feet and we just give you all authority in Jesus' name. Amen. So there was a a young boy in Kabul, Afghanistan, and he got his hands on the New Testament. We call it the Injil. And uh, he said when he read the pages, the verses, they came off, they went in his eyes, and he can feel them land in his heart. (laughs) It's the living word of God. Amen. Wali just began to ingest the word, and it, it was changing him, and he was excited. He's told his mom, Mom, look, look, I'm, I'm reading this book, and it's, it's changing my life. And she said, what book is that? And she said, wait here, I'm going to go get your brothers, and she left. And after some time went by, he heard some commotion outside. He looked out the door, and there was an angry mob coming to kill him. So he jumped over the wall and ran for his life, and he went to a, a U.N. officer's home and knocked on the gate and, and, and said, uh, I'm reading this holy book, and, and my, my family is, is now angry. They want to kill me. C- c- can you help me? And this U.N. guy says, man, I don't know about this stuff, but the kook down the road does, so ask him. And so while he knocked on my door, and uh, I've started this conversation with him, and he's sharing his story. And I says, you know, can I pray with you? And as soon as I started praying with him, he just broke down weeping. And I says, what's going on? He says, man, I'm 19 and my own mother wants to kill me. So I brought him in the house and sit him down and I'm with my wife and we're just kind of discussing like, what, what, what are we going to do, right? You know, like, how do we, how do we handle this? And we came to the conclusion. I came back to Wally. I says, listen, um, I'm going to give you a room in my home and uh, I'm going to begin to disciple you. We're going to read the word. We're going to pray. We're going to worship together. We're going to be family. I gave him a job and he started just doing errands and running tasks for us. And 
Uh, one day he was out in the market and he came home and he was all out of breath, just breathing hard. I'm like, Waleed, what's going on? He says, well, I was out in the market and the call to prayer from the mosque and the big tall minarets went out and this happens five times a day and the Muslims go to the mosque and pray. Two men said, it's time to pray, let's go to the mosque. And I told them, no, no, I, I don't wanna pray. And they said, you have to pray. And I said, no, no, I don't wanna. So I just ripped my arm out of their grip and I came to your house. And I said, oh, no, go to the UN guy's house in that situation, right? Um, so I'm here standing with Walid, and I, I explained to him, I says, listen, Walid, you have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and the Lord loves you, he cares for you. You know, you go to that mosque and, and, and you'll see all these Muslims, everyone in this land, they're praying. Their prayers go up, but they fall right back down. You can go to that mosque, you can kneel down facing Mecca, knowing that our Lord listens to you. He hears your prayers. He leans his ear over you. Cry out to the Lord. Go back to that mosque and pray. Oh, he didn't really like this, and it was kind of a difficult, so he left. A couple weeks later, I get a, a knock on the gate, and um, I open it up, and Waleed's standing there, and he's been stabbed, and he has blood from the waist down. So I pick him up, I put him in my, my vehicle, my speed to light vehicle. I, 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 I gotta take him to the hospital. I'm nervous, I'm not sure what to do. I call up some of the local believers that I work with and I says, Waleed's been stabbed, what, what do I do? And they say, okay, just go to the hospital and drop him like in the front on the sidewalk and you, you need to get away, your life's in danger. That's tough, right? I, I, I get to the hospital and I pull him out of my vehicle and I lay him down on the sidewalk, driving away going, what am I doing? Lord, save him, keep him alive, heal him. A night goes by and I don't hear anything. Um, I talk to the believers and it says, you know, just we'll, we'll let you know. Another night, we don't know if he's alive now. We don't know if he's dead. We don't know his status. My wife and I are agonizing. It's like, you know, he's, he's like a little brother, like a son to me. And Finally, the third night, they, they call and I says, okay, you, you can come to the hospital, but I, we need you to dress in all the garb, keep your head down, and, and we're in the basement. So I, I get into this hospital, and, and believe me, before we went, saying goodbye to my wife, I, I didn't know if I'd see her again, but I know I had to be with him. I had to see him. So I go to this, this, this basement of the, the hospital, and it's like a dungeon. He's laying on this cot. He, he's wearing the same clothes, and all the blood's there dried up, and I'm like... He's not going to survive this. And I, I look at the doctor and I, I, I try to figure out what's going on. I says, you know, give me a wet towel. And I, I just go and I start scrubbing off the blood off of his legs, off of his feet. And the Lord says to me, minister to him as you would to me. It just burdens my heart. And he says, this is my church. I look at the guys. I'm like, we got to get him out of here. He, he's not going to survive. Like it's, and there, we don't know if the people at, are, that stabbed him are at the end of the hallway. And it's like, thick with fear in the room. I don't, I don't know what to do, but I know I've got to get him out. We're arguing. We finally come up with a plan. It's past midnight. We sneak him out of the hospital. There is a missionary hospital up in the mountains. We got to get him there. And so we get through the city, taking the back roads, and finally into the mountains, and I'm taking to this, this good hospital. And I get there. The missionaries come, and they greet us. I says, please keep him alive. Like, help this young man. And we drop him off. So I'll fast forward a few weeks later, I get a call, you can come see Waleed. So I come to the church and, or to the hospital and Waleed greets me and he's strong, he's healed, he's got his color back. And I'm like, oh, you're good. I didn't, how, like now, like, what do we do? Like, do, do I take you back home? Says, no, your family wants to kill you. I says, I can't take you to my village. I says, they're looking for you still. Like they, they don't want to kill you. I have been calling around and I, I found a teen challenge in Islamabad, Pakistan, they're willing to take you. And church, when I came to this teen challenge and the men came around him and I shared his, his story, they just accepted him and they loved him like a brother. And that is the body of Christ. That's how we work, yeah? And I just wanna, when I share this testimony, I also wanna take the opportunity for us to come together and pray for him and his family. So Lord, we thank you for Walid. We thank you for this testimony. We thank you for his life. And God, we just pray, Holy Spirit, you'd come upon him, strengthen him. And Lord, open the, the eyes of his, his family and his community, those that are around him, that they would see Jesus in him. They would see that he is a child of the Most High God, Lord, and you would save and build your church amongst the Afghan people in Jesus' name. 
Where we were living was dangerous, right? We, we had an, actually an article of the city that we were living in on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and it said it was the most dangerous city in the world. Every week we had a, a suicide bomber, we had a car bomb or a missile attack. Um, you know, often we're stressed about what we're going to have for dinner that night, you know, but <laughs> we'd have car bombs, and you'd hear the blast, and then the shockwave would rattle your organs and shake things off the wall, and we'd be waking up at night. We had missiles going over our heads. We'd hear about suicide bombers, and we couldn't go into that part of the city, and every morning we'd, we'd get a, a security briefing on what we could do and what we couldn't do, and we had, we had electricity, you know. It was on for, for an hour and off for four hours. Made it really difficult to watch a miniseries, you know, like when your laptop would die. And this was our stress, you know, amongst many other things. And in the summer, our, our electricity would go out and we'd watch the fan blades, you know, on the fan come to a stop and then you just start sweating. And my wife, she couldn't leave the house during the day. She wore a burqa when she went out and mostly she'd go out just at night, her blonde hair, and they would kind of give her away and we'd get kind of, you know, persecuted or just pushed around, like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And all these questions. And we had to, we wanted to avoid those situations. So she normally just stayed in the house with most of the women and watched the kids. And I would go out. And one day I went out and I saw this guy, you know, big beard, had all the Muslim gear on. And, I, you know, I'm, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. And we, you know, you grew up around here, you know, where are you from? Like, we're getting this conversation. And I just feel this peace coming from him. Well, that day I went home and I said, honey, I just met this guy. And it's so, such a peaceful conversation. And she said, well, we'll, we'll go meet him again. And, and so that night I actually was like dreaming about him. And I was, I don't know, I just was excited. And I woke up in the morning. I'm like, yeah, well, I got to go find this guy. So I went back out and again, I met with him and began to have a conversation. And in this conversation, like, again, I started feeling peace come from him. And then this peace transitioned. And I heard the Lord say to me, witness to him. Okay. Where we're living there is a, a blasphemy law. So if I were to exalt anybody over the name of Muhammad, I legally can be killed. And the police would come and say, what happened here? Oh, this man was proselytizing. And the police would say, well, let his body rot here in the street so all can see what happens to those who try to convert Muslims. Close case. The Lord is saying, witness to him. You know, and there's these times even in scripture, you know, and, and Jesus say, come, you know, get out of the boat. And, <laughs> raging, you know, I don't know, but we just do it, right? So I stepped out of the boat, and I said to this man, zama chodai, zama plarde, which means my God is my father. Now I have removed myself from Islam. You see, because Muslims believe that Allah is the master, and they are the slaves. But I said, I have a God, and he is my father. So he legally can kill me. But he smiles and nods. So now I'm like standing on the water, right? <laughs> I take another step of faith. So I say to him, Zama chodai zui isade, which means my God's son is Jesus. And he says, yes, he is. And I'm ready to pass out. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, who are you? He says, my name is Sultan Ali. He said, all the men in my family have been leaders of the mosque. We, we have been trained in the Quran since we were little boys. And what, one night, I had a dream. And then this dream, I saw myself, I was walking to Madrasa, the, the Quran school. And on the way there, there was a big storm, lightning, thunder, just taking out the, the, the Madrasa. And it was so bad, I, I turned and I saw a long hallway. And at the end of this hallway, I saw a lady and she pointed into a room. And in this room was a man standing full of glory. I woke up from my dream. It's about the time for me to, to go to the Quran school. On my way there, I was looking for the storm. There was no storm. I got in and I sat down with my teachers and I explained to them the, the dream that I had the night before. And then when I finished, they looked at me and said, you now are unclean, don't ever come back here again. He said, I lost my job, my, my, my identity, my, my career. And all I knew is I needed to find who is this man that's full of glory. And the Lord led my steps and I met a missionary. And this missionary, he began to read stories to me out of his holy book. And of these stories, I recognized this. This is the man full of glory that I saw in my dream. How do I meet him? And the missionary instructed to me that I need to pray in faith. And I gave my life to Jesus. And this missionary was working with other men just like me in a small group. They were Pashtuns, strong Muslims, but they had given their life to Jesus. 
And to, together we would gather, we'd read the scriptures, we'd pray, we'd worship, hear the stories from this, this missionary. One day the missionary didn't come. He was always on time, but this day he, he didn't make it, and we were confused. And so we left the, the, the home and went down the street, and, and there was some commotion at an intersection, and there we saw the missionary's car, and he was shot and killed, martyred for sharing his faith with us. And me and the other guys, we looked at each other. We knew our lives were in danger, and so we ran. He says to me, I haven't spoken or prayed or worshiped or prayed with another believer in nine months, and now you're standing in front of me saying that Jesus is the Son of God. Church, I grabbed him, (laughs) hugged him, prayed with him. I brought him in my home. We read the scriptures together. We worshiped. We prayed together. I brought him into the small group of believers that I was working with, I baptized him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and became an elder in the underground persecuted church. I want to pray for Sultan Ali and his family right now. Father, we thank you for this testimony. We thank you how good you are, Lord, that you would rescue and seek out those, Lord, who are God-fearing and share your truth with them and dreams and a vision. And Lord, I even... I bring your command to these people to pray. You say to pray, this is your command. And there's some even in the house today that are intercessors, Lord. And they would say, yes, Lord, use me to intercede on behalf of those who have never heard. And I believe it was a woman in his dream that was praying for him. And she pointed in a room and he saw the man full of glory. Lord, would they be intercessors in the house today, Lord, that you would be calling them and they would be available in the middle of the night and they would pray for those who would never ever have heard before, and you would come to them with your glory in a dream or vision. Bless Sultan Ali's family as he shone his son, as he carries on the ministry, and Father, plant your church among the Pashtuns. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Um, my team had dwindled down to just uh, one other family and a single girl. Uh, my best friend, Saj, and his wife, Sarah, and their daughter, Hosanna, and uh, Carla's from Nebraska. Carla uh, is a, a dear friend of ours. We went through a lot with her. Um, she had a daughter, and her daughter had a seizure when she was pregnant in the, the ninth month, and she was home on furlough, and she was born with the, the inability to communicate. And she survived for 11 years, and she, she died a few years ago, and God's sending Carla back onto the field we had been a lot, through a lot together, and uh, some of the pain that we go through in life, there's a purpose to it. And um, I don't know if anybody had a, you know, a child that didn't have the ability to socialize, but it's, it's, it's a painful thing. And she, she served 11 years stateside with her heart still amongst the Pashtuns, amongst the Afghan people. And um, they're going back, though, and that's a, a victory that the Lord has. Our other teammate, uh, Sajid, so we had prayer meetings every morning. And uh, the Lord gave us a vision. You see, over the Muslim world, it's like a, just a stronghold. You know, it's just a, this black tar mat that just is over the countries. And, but God had showed us a picture that there was a, a hole that was seared open over our home. And so when we worshiped him, he received glory. And when you see the glory to heaven, you don't want to stop. You just want to say, Father, you're worthy. We magnify your name. Jesus, it's you alone. God, we praise you. The Lamb of God who's seated at the right hand. Father, you're you're seated. He's at the right hand, interceding amongst us that we would do your deeds, Lord, that we would advance the kingdom. Father, this work, we just worshiped him, worshiped him. And he would fashion these arrows of light, and we'd see the the, the arrows shoot through the the, the stronghold in the homes, and and Muslims would receive visions, dreams, and divine appointments would happen. So we would worship him every morning. That was our job. That was clocking in. The end of this prayer meeting, right at the end of it, I, I, I felt ill. And believe me, we have every virus and amoeba and single cell bacteria in this village, and so you get sick all the time, and it meant code brown. <laughs> so I was, I was out for the count, and um, this prayer meeting, I, I came back out, and I said, I'm not going to be able to work today. And uh, so Sajid said, well, you know, just call me, you know, and we'll, we got some stuff we got to deal with today. We had 50 Muslims that worked for us. We had chicken farms, fish farms. We were rebuilding schools. 
big humanitarian operation. So that day we talked on the phone a bunch and normally we open the office and all the workers come in and then at five o'clock we close the office and we go home. And well, two blocks from my house, it's a dirt road and the rain just washed away part of the road and you always have to slow your car right at this, this spot. Um, and that day there was a, an ambush of the Taliban and they shot and killed my teammate. And uh, my wife and I, we fell apart and uh, we, just, we were just ripped apart from the seams, just broken, weeping. Uh, I never felt such pain. My daughter's just pulling on us, and we just couldn't parent. We couldn't do anything. Phones ringing and ringing. And finally, we answer one of the calls, and it's the only other missionary in, in the city from Australia. And he says, where, where were you? Why didn't you go to work? And I says, well, I was sick. I, I didn't go to work. And he, said, he said, the Lord spared you then. And this pain just went even deeper. And we ran, and we, we went to his, his wife and his daughter, Hosanna. We brought him into our home, and they, they just, we just grieved Grieve the loss of a, a martyred missionary. And now she's the widow of a, a martyred missionary whose blood that we know that God will redeem, but, but you don't have the full picture. Every night we'd weep with her, to cry with her. God, save her. Be her father. Be her, be her husband. Be her everything, Lord. Give her your peace. But she would just shake and we'd just fall asleep crying night after night. One morning we're in the kitchen making breakfast and um, Sarah and Hosanna, she was two years old at the time, they come in the kitchen, and Sarah's grinning from ear to ear. And I'm like, Sarah, you're smiling. What, what happened? And she said, last night I had a dream, and I, I saw my husband in heaven, and, and, and standing next to him were, were, were two boys the same ages as my miscarriages. And I, I cried out, why? Why, why, why? why did you die? Why, why did they kill you? And, and, and she heard a voice, and she said, well, I was on my way home, from work, and two angels came in the car and took me to heaven. Nobody killed me. <laughs> in the kingdom of God, there's everything we need, his hope, his peace, the righteousness, the goodness of God. He knows how many hairs are on our head. He knows the amount of breasts. You're in the palm of his hand. Your days are marked out for his deeds, for his glory, that he would use you to share his love in this suffering world. It was about six months after that, and, uh, you know, we got a knock on our gate, and outside the gate was all the men in my village, the imam who runs the mosque, my neighbor who's got two wives, <laughs> my other neighbor who's got kids my kid's age that we played together, and we've been in their homes, we had meals, we've been to their weddings, you know, and, and they stood there in front of me, and they said, oh, you're alive. I'm like, What? They said, well, the last three nights, there's been two men with guns outside your home. They said, we can't protect you anymore. You have to leave. Every little bit of strength I had left just kind of drained out. And I just went in the house. I told my wife, we picked up our daughters, and we evacuated. When we got back to America, we, you know, we would go to church, but we were quite a mess. We were broken. And we had one service. The lady said, hey, are you the, the missionaries that were in Afghanistan? I said, well, yeah. Um, what happened to you on these dates? And I looked at her, you know, like her planner. Remember those? <laughs> and I looked at the dates and I said, I know what happened on those dates, but tell me what happened to you. And she said, I saw your prayer card. And I said, oh, Lord, be with them. But then God spoke to me and said, pray for their lives. They're in danger. When I started praying, I couldn't stop for three days. She said, what happened to you? And I said, those were the three days the Taliban had came to our house. And God used you and this church and many others. And this prayer and this intercession went up into heaven. And the Lord heard the, the cry of his people. And a hedge of protection was brought down around my home and kept the Taliban at bay. And I got to come back to America even to share these stories. And I'm alive today because you prayed. Praise God. Thank you. Amen. Our leadership said, you know, we can go anywhere we want in the world. But... Um, can't go back to Afghanistan. And so we left a lot of our heart there. Um, we prayed and, and God called us to Turkey. He gave us a vision of our family on top of a big rocky mountain and around it was raging waters, people drowning in the waters. And we were casting nets and pulling them up onto this mountain, saving their lives. Well, Turkey's a mountainous peninsula with raging waters, seas all around it, 
big mountains. We thought, okay, we won't argue. We'll go there. And so I told my leadership, and they said, well, uh, we have this area in the northeast of Turkey, and it's, it's got zero believers, zero churches, zero access, access to Scripture, zero missionaries. Like, would you go there? I said, I'll sign up. I'm going. So we, we got the house all set up. You know, I installed the dishwasher and hung up pictures on the wall and got the bunk bed made for the girls. And then I wanted to put my feet up and relax. And then my wife said, no, go make disciples, right? <laughs> so I grabbed one of the girls and I went to the park and I began to push my daughter on a swing. Now, we had just gotten to Turkey, so I didn't speak the language. I spoke a different language before. And I knew merhaba and chai, which means hi, tea, you know? So another man's pushing his daughter on a swing, and I, I use up everything I got, merhaba. And I said, chai, you know? And he laughs at me, like, what is this foreigner doing here, you know? And we figured it out, and so he, he, we arranged for us to go to his house for tea with our family that night. So I was excited, went to home, and said, hey, babe, we're going to go, you know, meet this, this family. And so we got the girls' hair and ponytails. We got all ready, and we went to their house, and their apartment building is right across from ours. So we go up the stairs, knock on their apartment, and their family's there. They open the door, and, and, and as we're greeting them, they're putting on their jackets, and they're coming out in the hallway with us. And I'm like, okay, how does this work? Uh, then we go up the stairs, and we knock on another door, and there's another family there and their kids, and, and they're putting on their coats, and, and they come out into the hallway. So now we're like three families, right? And I, what is happening? What do we, is this how you do it here? I don't know. Then we go down the stairs, and then we knock on another floor, and then there's a grandma and a grandpa, and there's another family behind there, and we all go into their home. So we got two brothers and a sister. They're married with all their kids and our family, and they sit like a, you know, a half circle around us, and then the, the tea is served, the chai, and then we say merhaba. You know, to each person, and then they just stare at the foreigners. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> well, this is the start, okay? <laughs> so let's go, like, you know, four years fast forward, all right? We learn the language, praise God. We learn the culture. We learn how to communicate, and, and, and we celebrate their holidays, and, and we, we celebrate our holidays. So we actually we stuffed the turkey in Turkey, shared with them Thanksgiving. We went to their, their weddings. We learned that they, they tighten the light bulb and they pet the puppy, and that's how they celebrate in their dances, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we went to their funerals. And, and the men, they, they, you know, it's, it's a six foot deep, and, and the men, they have to shovel. And it's not just some ceremonial thing. They, they gave me the shovel. And when the great-grandmother died, I, I had to shovel and shovel. And so I broke a sweat while all the, the women stood on the side just weeping and wailing. And we cried with them. We celebrated with them. And we had our opportunity. We shared Jesus. I gave them the scriptures. And they said, oh, we are Muslims, and you're a Christian. But no, we are friends. And that's where it was left. So one night, you know, we're all at my house drinking tea. There's about four or five, maybe 20 people there. And uh, having a good time, talking about sports, talking about politics, laughing at our kids. And the grandfather says to me, Bubba, he says, how come you never play the guitar? And I said, um, well, that's my guitar I, I worship Jesus with. I, I just, I sing songs to the Lord. Well, sing us a song. Now, I'm not like a, like a singer song, right? I'm not really a good musician. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I just learned a Turkish worship song. So I just, you know, and I go to put the guitar away and, and the bubba, he says, play it again. And I'm like, oh. So there in the air, I sing the song, and I, I'm putting the guitar away. Play it again. <laughs> the Lord is saying, just, just worship me. This is between you and I. Seek my presence. Seek my face. And so I get the guitar, and I just start worshiping in their language. And then you know what happens? The older brother comes and sits next to me. He grabs the lyrics and starts singing them, of course, with a better accent, right? He starts singing them, right? And then you know what happens? They all pull out their cell phones and start recording. <laughs> so, so that night wraps up, and we are like, what just happened? Our prayers are being answered. Like, we just worship. We've been praying. Like, we went from, like, where, where do you start? Like, you, you, you know, but we all of a sudden, we're worshiping with them. So a few weeks later go by, and I get uh, a phone call. And they say, hey, um, we had an emergency last night. Our, our daughter, she's like a year and a half. We were on our way to the ER. She was in a high fever. She had hives, and she was like scream crying. 
And just trying to calm her down, on the way to the hospital, we gave her the phone, and, and the video of you and her uncle singing that song to Jesus came up. And she was completely healed. The fever went away, the hives went away, and she stopped crying. I was like, this is amazing. So I went to the grandfather, and I asked him, hey, did you hear about your granddaughter? He said, yes, we're all talking about how this song that you sang on video healed her. I said, can we get together and we just kind of share their, like, what the song means and where the scripture is? He says, we would love that. We would hope you would do that. So we got together and we celebrated that Jesus healed the granddaughter and we worshiped in spirit and truth. I says, is it okay if we do this next week? And he says, yes, we would love that. So we met again the next week and the next week. And then one week early on, he said, you know what? I want to meet, but... I have this pain in my arm, and the vein is turning black, and it's going higher and higher. I says, if that gets to your heart, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, yeah, we need to go to the hospital. But first, can, I, can we just pray for it, and, and then we'll go. And so I laid hands, and I said, God, would you heal my Baba's arm and this vein that's got an infection or something? And I lifted it off, and it was completely healed. And he said, what did you do? I said, this is the God we serve. This is our Jesus that cares for our, our, our little needs and our big needs, and he just healed you. And now we can worship him. And we worshiped. We discipled them. They were baptized. They baptized others, and we planted the church. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, it's amazing when the, when the grandfather believes the rest of the family, like they just have that authority. And every family member would come and we would lay hands. They would be filled with the Holy Spirit. We had this, this great anointing just to share with everybody in that family. It was just an incredible time. So let me uh, pray for this family. Lord, I thank you for the Duran Lar uh, and their, their movings, their comings and goings, Lord, and the things that have happened in their families, Lord. I just pray even now you would just strengthen them in their faith in you, Jesus, Lord, that they would be a witness in their communities, Lord God, that you would save each and every one of them, Lord. And Father, that you alone, Lord God, receive the glory in their life and they would be your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm trying to figure out that time. So I got till 30, right? I got seven minutes left. All right, cool. We're good. All right, so this is a good one. So this is uh, Eric Kahn. Now, uh, up in the north... There's unreached people groups that have never heard of Jesus. There's races of people that never heard. And we have an internet ministry. We run ads. And if they're interested in scripture, knowing who Jesus is, we get their information and then I text them. And I followed up with this guy. And he says to me, I found out that my great-great-grandmother was a Greek believer in Jesus. When I was a little boy, when I learned that, I knew that I should never give my whole heart to Islam. He said, I've waited 20 years to meet a believer. <laughs> Sharing Jesus with him, he received Christ, and he gave his whole heart to Jesus. Yeah, praise God. So during the pandemic, we were all in lockdowns. And we were calling some of the believers, trying to figure out, you know, what was going on and, you know, where, where everybody was at. And, you know, we weren't able to meet together. And when I called Eric Khan, his son answered the phone. His son's name is Muhammad. And uh, I said, oh, Muhammad, I said, where, where's your dad? And he goes, I was hoping you called because I have a lot of questions I have for you. I'm like, okay. He says, listen, when, 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 when my father changed his religion and the things that he started believing in, a lot of things changed in my family. So my grandfather died, and after my grandfather died, my father became the head of our entire family. He is the oldest, and he has all the honor. And since he's changed, he started changing things for our whole family. And you see, against our family, we have enemies. And those enemies have been our enemies since my great-grandfather, and they have done evil against us, and so we've done evil against them. That means there has been honor killings against these two families, and there's enmity between these two families. But he says, I need to understand my father's religion because what he has done has brought a great shame in our family. Since he became the head of our family, he wouldn't ask our enemies for forgiveness. Why did he do that? 
It's a tough question over the phone, right? You know, like, so I just, okay, how, where do I start, you know? And, well, Jesus told us to turn the cheek, love our enemies, like, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so I'm, like, kind of discipling this, 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 this young boy, you know, he's, I think he's, like, 18 at the time, and he, about this, these attributes, this character of Christ that they've never heard about. And he's questioning after, well, why would you do this? Why would you? So I'm, I'm sharing the gospel with him. I, I am sharing with him who Jesus is. And I'm like, okay, tell me what's going on. No, no, I need to understand completely why my father would ask for forgiveness for his enemies. So we kind of establish this. He understands why. And I say, what is going on? He says, my father, he asked for forgiveness. He got on his knees and he forgave our enemies. And when my uncle, his brother, found out he did this, it brought shame in our family. And so my uncle shot him and he's now in the hospital. I said, what? What? The doctors told me he has 24 hours and they're going to pull the plug. He's on life support. And the police have came to me as the next in kin that I have to be the one who has to say, yes, we're pressing charges against my uncle and he should do life in prison. But if my father forgave his enemies, then, then surely he would forgive my uncle. Is that, is that right? Oh my goodness, like... What kind of conversation am I having right now? This is intense, right? So I call up some of the other believers. We're trying to figure out. They all move into time of fasting and prayer. We have 24 hours, and they're pulling the plug. I then have a conversation with my wife and my kids saying, listen, if Air Khan dies, they will have a, immediately they have a funeral. I have to go to that funeral. I'm the one who led him to the Lord. I'm the one who discipled him. I'm the one who baptized him. I have to show that I... Trust in the Lord, and I will go and represent in honor and be there at his funeral. Well, but I'm sure the uncle will be there, and I'm the one who brought this on the whole family. Okay, kids, let's pray, right? I, that night, I was, I was scared. Like, what am I going to do? Like, but Lord, this is the right thing to do. You'll protect me, and so I will go to the funeral. So the next day... I call up Muhammad, he gets on the phone, and I says, what's going on? He says, yeah, you know, I'm not allowed in the hospital because of COVID and stuff like that, but they're going to come out and get me, they're going to pull the plug, and I'm going to go in with the police, and if he dies, then I'll have to make a statement. Okay, call me back. This is it. I'm praying, my wife's praying, the believers are praying, kids are praying. He calls back. This is what happened. Well, we went in, the police were there, the nurses, the doctor. They pulled the plug. It flatlined. And then my dad woke up. And the police immediately, are you there? Can you, can you speak? He said, yeah, I, I'm here. Do you press charges against your brother for shooting you? And he said, I was dead. I'm alive. I follow Jesus. He was dead and he's alive. What, what more could he do to me? Of course I forgive him. Then the doctor said, no, 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 you don't understand. He shot you four times. He tried to kill you. I forgive him. Church, he walked out of that hospital. He went back to work two weeks later. I was like Thomas. I was like, where are the holes? Like, I want to see. I don't believe this. Like, he's a miracle. Look, this is the kingdom. It's not what's on the news. It's not the pain that's in your family or in your body or at your workplace, your communities. The kingdom is hope. The kingdom is the glory of God that he wants to reveal to each one of us through us as we obey his commands, as we pray, as we press in as the body of Christ. We each have our parts. In church, we want to go home. I want to, I want to be done crying. I want to be with the Father. He's going to prepare a home for us, right? And I want every tribe, every nation, every tongue to be there. So I'm going to pray, and there's going to be a video, and we'll, we'll close out. So, Father, I pray for the church. I pray for the believers. I pray for those who are gathered here right now. And, God, I ask for your grace, your mercy in all of us, Lord, that, Father, we, we will just we'll say yes to your name. We'll say yes to your will. Lord, we'll say yes to the, the, the prophecies, Lord, that, God, you will pour out your spirit on all flesh. 
And Lord, I believe you're saving the best for last and you will pour out your spirit on the Muslim world and we will see the greatest revival of all these people that for centuries, Lord, have been dying without you. God, we want to be a part of it, Lord God. Here I am, send me, Lord. I'll be your intercessor. Lord, I'll be your sender. I'll be your giver. Lord, I want to go. God, I thank you for, for Cornerstone and all that you're doing in this church. Father, I thank you that there is a strong arm of believers here that has sent us, that has prayed for us. And until the end, Lord God, may you receive all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.